Welcome to Pepke Auditorium. I'm Kitty Boone, Vice President at the Aspen Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to yet another in our wonderful series, the McClos McCloskey Speaker Series, and as well as our audience on KJAX and our viewers on Grassroots TV. I want to thank, as always, Tom and Bonnie for making this spectacular speaker series every summer a reality for the Aspen Institute. Um, before we get going, I do want you to know that at the end of the Q&A tonight, we'll have two microphones circulating. So if you'll just wait for a microphone to get to you so your question can be heard um, by the broadcast and on television, that would be a great help. It's my great privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker, Peter Galbraith. You might be familiar with the name Galbraith. His father, John Kenneth Galbraith, was one of the leading progressive economists of the 20th century and an important advisor to Democratic presidents from Truman to Clinton. His brother, James Galbraith, is also a prominent economist at the University of Texas. Peter has had a very impressive career himself, spanning several senior leadership positions in the US government and the UN. As the first US ambassador to Croatia, he mediated the 1995 Erdut Agreement that ended the Croatia War. He was a cabinet member in the first transitional government of East Timor, and designed the territory's first interim government and the process to write East Timor's permanent constitution. Ambassador Galbraith is one of America's foremost experts on Iraq, having been a regular visitor to the country since the early 1980s. As a staff member for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he uncovered Saddam Hussein's murderous campaign against the Iraqi Kurds, documenting chemical weapons, attacks on Kurdish villagers, and the depopulation of rural Kurdistan. His accounts provided early warning of the catastrophe overtaking the civilian population and contributed to the decision to create a safe ho haven in northern Iraq. Galbraith served in 2009 as Deputy Special Re Representative for Afghanistan to the Security General of the United States. And I, I'm going to add that uh, because we were able to invite him to this, he's also leading this week a great seminar for the Society of Fellows at the Aspen Institute on Afghanistan and Pakistan. And if you want to know more about that, you can talk to us afterwards. Um, finally, uh, Ambassador Galbraith's books, The End of Iraq, How American Incompetence Created a War Without End, and Unintended Consequences, How War in Iraq Strengthened America's Enemies, are both available for sale in the lobby, and he will sign them after his presentation. Please join me in heartily welcoming Ambassador Peter Galbraith. Kitty, thank you for that uh, very kind um, introduction. And uh, some of you will have noticed uh, the arc of my career as she described it from staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to US ambassador to Croatia to cabinet minister in East Timor. In short, a career of ever more important jobs in ever smaller places. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> Tom and uh, Bonnie McCloskey, uh, also my thanks uh, for sponsoring this uh, lecture series, an opportunity to discuss with uh, such an informed audience, uh, uh, the critical issue of Afghanistan, uh, and to, to depart from the serious, the uh, also the very great pleasure of being here in Aspen, uh, in such a beautiful place, uh, and at least uh, today with such beautiful weather, uh, and joined by my family. The title that I have given for this talk is the Afghanistan Quagmire. And so from the title, you can probably derive um, what my view of the situation is. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, fairly straightforward. We are embarked on a mission which, in which we cannot succeed, even by the terms of those who have put forward the mission. There are two main types of uh, warfare. 
Uh, there is uh, territorial warfare and there's counterinsurgency. In territorial warfare, uh, conventional warfare, if you will, uh, the idea is you uh, kill or disperse or capture your enemy, you take your enemy's territory, and uh, either they sue for peace, or, if, or if, you're, if they don't, you defeat them by taking their entire territory and the war is over. But the center of gravity, what you're fighting over in, in a conventional war, is essentially territory. Now the United States recognizes, and our military leaders recognize, that in, an, in Afghanistan we cannot fight, we are not fighting a conventional war. Uh, it is, as a practical matter, not possible to kill or capture enough of the Taliban, of the insurgents, to take the territory and to hold it indefinitely. Yes, we can take any piece of Afghanistan that we wish to take, we can hold it, but then what? We just keep holding it, we don't have the forces to hold the entire territory, we haven't actually killed the Taliban, we've simply dispersed them, uh, and they can come back. And even to the extent where we end up striking at the Taliban, quite often uh, we do it in such a way that we create, have created a, a number of uh, collateral civilian casualties. Uh, and in the context of Afghanistan, that is to say, a society characterized by very extended families, tribal connections, uh, 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 accidental or collateral casualties uh, produce uh, hundreds of new enemies. And so, since it is not possible to seize and hold the territory and to deny it to the Taliban, we have adopted, that is, in short, not possible to win the Afghanistan war through conventional means, we've adopted a counterinsurgency strategy, which obviously uh, is, makes a lot of sense. And in a counterinsurgency strategy, the center of gravity is the people. The basic idea of a counterinsurgency is you secure, uh, you, you secure the population, you make them feel, you make them safe, you exclude the insurgents, uh, and then uh, you, you win them over by providing good government, economic development, uh, and, and as they become secure, as they see the benefits of your administration, uh, they, the moderate, the, those insurgents who are less committed will come over to your side, they'll flip, and the population will then rat out the hardliners and the insurgency will be defeated. That's the, that's the nub of the strategy in which we are embarked. Now the problem is that of course the United States uh, being uh, very much a foreign country in Afghanistan with few people who speak Dari or Pashtu and in particular since the insurgency is almost entirely in the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan, uh, very few people who speak Pashtu, we ourselves cannot win over the population. Uh, so we need to have a partner that's capable of winning over the population. And it is that element, that essential element of the strategy that is missing. And that is why the counterinsurgency strategy to which we have 100,000 troops and are spending $100 billion a year cannot succeed. Now just, I, I was reading a, a General David Petraeus, the new commander in, um, of the uh, international forces in Afghanistan. I was reading his guidance uh, on his strategy and just to, I'll, read, I'll, I'll quote a part of it simply to confirm the point I've made to you. Uh, the, the first point in his um, a uh, strategy is the following, S secure and serve the population. The decisive terrain is the human terrain, not the actual geographic terrain, not the ground, but the people. Uh, borrowing Clausewitz's phrase, he goes on to say, the people are the center of gravity. 
Only by providing them uh, security and earning their trust and confidence can the Afghan government and ISAF prevail. Right there in that state, statement, uh, the, the first uh, four sentences of his mission statement, he's talking about the Afghan government and ISAF. Uh, he also recognizes some of the, well, problems of the Afghan government. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that in a minute because the essential element for success is a, a credible Afghan partner that does not exist. And, and it's not, not going to be hard, I think, to persuade you that it doesn't exist. We have a clear track record in Afghanistan under the administration of President Hamid Karzai, who has been in office since 2002. We have an eight-year record on which we can judge the government of Afghanistan. And it is a record over eight years of corruption and ineffectiveness. Transparency International, the respected NGO, ranks countries on the degree of corruption. And Afghanistan ranks second to last. It ranks as the second most corrupt country in the world just ahead of Somalia. <laughs> Somalia, as you know, has no government at all. So it's fair to say that Hamid Karzai actually runs the most corrupt government in the world. Second, effectiveness. Hamid Karzai is known in Afghanistan, among, the, among Afghans, uh, among the diplomats who serve there, and among those who follow it, as the mayor of Kabul. This is the phrase that has been attached to him at least since 2004. What does it mean? It means that the writ of his administration does not extend beyond the capital. In the north of Afghanistan, which is the part of the country that is inhabited by the non-Pashtun groups, the Tajiks at about 25%, the Hazaras at 10%, the Uzbeks, the Turkmen's, and other groups. Uh, 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 Karzai does not exercise control there. This is the territory of the former, of the Northern Alliance, the people who had opposed the Taliban in the 1990s. Uh, and the writ of his administration does not actually extend there uh, uh, on the ground, although theoretically it does. And in the south of Afghanistan, the Pashtun areas, Karzai's a Pashtun, in his own native region, the writ of his government doesn't extend there because the countryside is controlled by the Taliban, as is most of Kandahar, Afghanistan's second largest city, most of the time. So <clears throat> we have a strategy that requires a credible local partner, uh, and this is, uh, 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 but it requires one who. Uh, is actually something other than what this one is. Uh, and I'll read you the third paragraph of Betraeus' guidance to the troops. Help confront the culture of impunity. The P Taliban are not the only enemy of the people. The people are also threatened by inadequate governance, corruption, and abuse of power. Recruiters for the Taliban. President Karzai has forthrightly committed to combat these threats. Work with our Afghan partners to turn his words into reality and to help our partners protect the people from malign actors as well as from terrorists. Well, there's a, it's a nice statement, and of course you can understand why if you're the commander of the forces in Afghanistan, you would have to put it that way. But the truth is, President Karzai is not remotely committed to combat the threats of governance, corruption, and abuse of power. In fact, he heads a government that forthrightly practices uh, 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 inadequate governance, corruption, and abuse of power. And there's no reason to believe that his administration is going to change. There is only one thing that is different about Karzai as he has entered his new term of office. 
that is different from the previous eight years. And that is to say, he is in office as a result of having stolen the election in 2009. He is in office as a result of massive fraud that was committed, certainly committed on his behalf, almost certainly with his involvement, quite likely at his direction. So add to corrupt, ineffective, illegitimate. So the, the one new fe fe feature on this essential partner is that uh, he is illegitimate. Let, let me say a word about these uh, elections in, in 2009. Uh, there were 41 candidates. Uh, the elections were carried out by the Independent Election Commission. Uh, the, they were paid for by the United States, about $200 million in American money, about $100 million from other donors. Without that money, they could not have been held because the Afghans didn't have the resources to do it. The UN had a, uh, a mandate to support uh, the Independent Election Commission, the Afghan electoral institution, in the holding of free, fair, transparent, and inclusive elections. The problem, as it turned out, was that the Independent Election Commission, whom, who's, who, for whom we were paying, and for whom the UN, a mission of which I was the deputy, was supposed to support, were in fact the very people committing the fraud. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were six million votes cast in the election. Karzai, uh, in the final preliminary results, had slightly more than three million, slightly more than the 50% needed to avoid a runoff. But of his three million, at least one million possibly as much as a million and a half were votes that were not cast by voters. I can't say that in all these instances that the election commission stuffed the ballots because what you have to understand is that it's a big job to, to produce a million and a half phony votes and that's you know doing a lot of access. And these guys uh, you know, were not quite so energetic they simply had the device of reporting results from polling centers that never actually existed. There were 1,200 what I called ghost polling centers in Afghanistan. Uh, these were centers that were located on a map, but located on a map in places that either were controlled by the Taliban or that were so insecure that nobody could go there. Uh, so you, you, you didn't have any uh, observers, you didn't have any NGOs, you didn't have any candidate agents, and you didn't have any, and conveniently, you didn't actually have any voters. And that turns out to be a perfect place to commit fraud, because actually nobody's observing, especially if the place doesn't actually exist. Uh, <clears throat> And incidentally, I've, I've tried to explain this to people. There's retail fraud and there is wholesale fraud. Retail fraud, of course, is commonplace uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, and, I mean, people argue that it took place in the, in, for, it's taking place in the United States. Certainly it takes place in the United States. People vote twice. Uh, the voting machines are manipulated. Uh, you. Maybe it isn't quite fraud, but uh, you, you have very few minority, uh, voting machines in places where minorities are. You have a large number of voting machines in, in the suburbs. Uh, but retail fraud, first, it's actually hard to detect. And second, it really only matters if the election is extremely close. Think Florida 2000. Yes, you know, a few... A few uh, uh, of, of phony votes, double voting, misdesigned ballot, and you can change the result. Uh, wholesale fraud is something quite different. First, it involves large numbers of ballots. You aren't just trying to tip a close election, you're, you're trying to gather large numbers of, uh, produce large numbers of votes. Uh, and it is very obvious. And the fraud in the Afghanistan elections uh, was very obvious to us. I had a team of people working for me uh, who were monitoring the elections. It was obvious to us on election night. How? 
Well, uh, as the results came in, we had, we'd spent the day getting a very good idea of the turnout in a number of the key provinces. Uh, in um, Kandahar, in the south, uh, west, sorry, southeast, and then along the Afghanistan border, uh, border with Pakistan, Paktika, above that, uh, uh, Paktia and uh, coast. Uh, and what was clear in those provinces was that basically nobody voted. Now, we didn't have people actually at the polling centers counting. First, it wasn't safe. And second, it's hard to have people counting voters at polling centers that don't exist. But we, we had a you know, good idea of the turnout within a certain range. For example, in Kandahar province, we knew it was between 2 and 10%. When the returns came in from Kandahar, in the city it was about 30%. In the districts immediately around the city, it was about 60%. And uh, in the far outlying districts, it was about 200%. Uh, <clears throat> and when you examine the results more closely, did a forensic examination, for example, in Shorbach, a district of Kandahar, uh, there were eight, uh, two polling centers, each with um, uh, eight polling stations within the polling center. Uh, in the polling center one, the first six polling centers reported exactly 500 votes for Karzai and the last two reported 512 each for 4,024 votes for Karzai out of 4,024 votes cast. And the same pattern, 4,048 for Karzai out of 4,048 in the other polling center. Now what was striking about Shorbach was that the leaders of Shorbach, the tribal elders, had actually endorsed Abdullah Abdullah, Karzai's main rival. Uh, anyhow, all of this was um, was readily apparent to us. Uh, and of course, as this became clear, readily apparent uh, to Afghans. Uh, and that uh, underscores, again, the difficulty of the counterinsurgency. Let me read one final element of, uh, of, uh, of Petraeus's guidance to the troops. Identify corrupt officials. President Karzai has said, my government is committed to fighting corruption with all means possible. Well, the slight problem with that statement is, of course, the act of stealing an election is what enables you to steal everything else. Uh, help the government achieve that aim. Make sure the people we work with work for the people. If they don't, work with partners to enable action or will appear to be or we will appear to be part of the problem. Bring networks of malign actors to the attention of trusted Afghan partners and your chain of command. What happens if you don't have any uh, trusted Afghan partners or the, the people who are uh, at the highest level are themselves corrupt? That, in essence, is the dilemma that we have. So <clears throat> just to recapitulate, I hope I've uh, persuaded you that there's a strong case to make that Karzai is not likely to become less corrupt. We have a record on that. It's not likely to become uh, more effective and that the case for his illegitimacy in the eyes of Afghans and frankly internationals is uh, open and shut. There's one other element about Karzai's administration I think that I have to comment on which is he's also weird. I don't know how to say that diplomatically. Uh, let me just illustrate. Uh, in, um, a after these uh, elections, uh, the, these fraudulent elections, uh, there was a big uh, debate within the United Nations as to whether we should do anything about it. My view was that, yes, we had some responsibility. It was a debate I lost, and although it was an internal debate, I ended up getting fired. At which point, I uh, wrote some op-eds highlighting the problem. Karzai vehemently denied, and, and this created a, a, a certain media sensation in uh, October of uh, last year. 
Uh, Karzai, of course, denied that there'd been any fraud or any problem with his reelection. But in the nature of it, although I could stir things up for some period of time, eventually you get forgotten. Uh, and so I was uh, in a, uh, operating in a certain amount of uh, obscurity. Uh, when on April 1st, Karzai gave a national television address in which he revised, revived all these issues. He said, yes, there was fraud in the Afghanistan elections. Previously, he denied it. But Afghans didn't do it. The UN did it. Galbraith did it. I was um, tracked down in Rome by the BBC. And uh, so I said, well, I think my, my reaction for, is that this must be uh, an April Fool's joke. Uh, but on reflection, perhaps not, because uh, we really don't have that kind of warm and personal relationship. Uh, anyhow, uh, and then I had a number of other th explanations. Of course, I had to explain that it was beyond my capability to organize a, a million and a half phony votes in Kandahar, Paktika, Pakti, and Kost. Uh, that any, if I could, I certainly wouldn't have done it for Karzai because I don't like him. <laughs> he doesn't like me. Uh, and finally, I allowed, perhaps somewhat injudiciously, that perhaps he was smoking something. <laughs> that actually being true. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, having done that, revived the issue. The next day, he called the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and apologized. That's April 2nd. April 3rd, he tells a group of Afghan parliamentarians that if they keep insisting on having honest parliamentary elections this fall, he's got to go join the Taliban. Now, that is probably not a very a political statement to make at a time that the American president has put his presidency on the line to send 100,000 troops to help you defeat the Taliban. And finally, on April 4th, he repeated his allegation that the UN had committed the fraud, but he added that it was also the Americans who had committed the fraud, which had left him in office. So uh, now we have, again, to, to recapitulate, corrupt, ineffective, illegitimate, and weird. <laughs> uh, how does this work on the ground? How does this work for the actual counterinsurgency strategy? We go into an area, we were in Helmand province, uh, in the south center there. We went into Marja uh, earlier this year. Cleared out the Taliban. Uh, actually, we didn't quite clear them out and we didn't kill very many. They simply went home. They, uh, some of them, they, they didn't take off their uniforms, they don't wear them. They, they just went back to the villages or they dispersed. Uh, we then, we were there, but in order, we, if there was going to be progress, we would need to have the Afghan army to come in to assist us in providing security, the Afghan police to provide law and order, and then the Afghan government uh, to provide honest administration and win the loyalty of the population. Uh, <clears throat> the army is the most developed part of institution in Afghanistan. We've spent a lot of money training it. It still can't operate on its own but at least it was something of a partner. The police are hopeless, and I'll come back to explain why. And the government, uh, we got Karzai to appoint a governor, but uh, he was uh, not effective, not seen as honest, and unable to uh, assert his authority. And so, more recently, the Taliban have been coming back in Marcha, and some 20 families a day are fleeing. Uh, and when they say 20 families, that's not a small number of people in Afghanistan. Uh, and the, 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 the fundamental problem, particularly in the, in the areas where the insurgency is, is that the local power brokers are not really separate from the Taliban. Uh, I say power brokers because we have an idea that if you're in office, you're in power, you're out of office, you're out of power. But in Afghanistan, it is more or less a coincidental leak, link whether you hold office and exercise power. So that there, in many of these Pashtun provinces, 
the main power broker does not hold office, or the person who holds office, the governor, has no power. That's certainly true in, in Kandahar, where the governor, uh, we, we, we forced Karzai to expel the power broker who was also the governor, who was also corrupt. We got him to bring in a very nice Canadian agricultural economist, uh, Afghan origin, who sits in the governor's palace. Uh, uh, no Afghans will come see him because it's dangerous to go there and he has no power. So he basically serves tea or nice meals to visiting US military and diplomats and journalists. Uh, but he, he doesn't actually exercise power. The power brokers in the South are people who have their own links with the Taliban. Uh, one case in point, Ahmed Wali Karzai, the president's brother, who is the head of the provincial council in Kandahar, again, that's not why he exercises power there, he exercises power because he's Karzai's brother. Uh, he is uh, reputedly a drug dealer. And who is he dealing drugs? Well, among others, with the Taliban. Uh, or you could look at uh, Uruzgan province, just north of Kandahar, where the Dutch were, they've just withdrawn. The, uh, we, we have a security contract there with the former governor, who's a local power broker, uh, in which he protects the trucks that are supplying the military coming there, as well as providing security to the military bases. Uh, of course, it's uh, very inconvenient for him to have his forces fight the Taliban. Uh, so what he does is pay off the Taliban. Uh, at one point, he, he was identified as a malign actor, should be removed. Uh, and so there was an effort to get rid of his security contract, which point he teamed up with the Taliban to stage some attacks to demonstrate his value. In short, the real image of what, it, of what local government is like in southern Afghanistan in the areas where the insurgency operates is basically the mafia. And under those circumstances, even if we could provide good security in an area that we take, even if we found an honest administrator to come in, even if the Afghan army and police could win the confidence of the population, who would want to rat out the, the, uh, the uh, uh, hardline insurgent? Who would want to say, Mohammed over there is making IEDs, when they would naturally be concerned that the fact that they had tipped off the local authorities to what Mohammed was doing would mean that it would get back to Mohammed and uh, something would happen. It, it, it isn't that you know the a head of a horse ends up in your bed in, in uh, in, in these areas, a uh, more typical thing, uh, your seven-year-old son ends up hanged on a tree. That sends a, a message. So the population is not going to do it. Uh, <clears throat> we can't, my, my basic argument is, Ben, we don't have a partner, we don't have it on the national level, we don't have it on the local level, there is no way that we can get a credible partner, and therefore we cannot succeed at our objective, which is to defeat the Taliban insurgency. And in that, but, uh, and in that sense, the sense that we are embarked on a campaign that cannot win, Afghanistan is like Vietnam. But there's also a very important difference, which is to say, unlike in Vietnam, the enemy can't win either, and that's why it is a true quagmire. This map gives a picture of the ethnic structure in Afghanistan. Uh, as I said, about half the population is Pashtun. The Taliban insurgency is almost exclusively a Pashtun movement located principally, as you can see in this map, in the south and the east, where the Pashtuns are. Uh, and in those areas, they control the countryside uh, and they can operate in the major towns and cities. There is no, basically no support among the Pashtuns uh, among the Tajiks, who are the second community with 20, about 25% of the population. 
uh, and absolutely none among the Hazaras who are in the central highlands around Bamiyan. They are Shiites. The Taliban are fundamentalist Sunni Muslims who view the Shiites as apostates who should be killed. And indeed, when, although this is one of the hidden stories of what happened in Afghanistan during Taliban rule, everybody knows about the destruction of the Buddhas in Bamiyan. But what they don't, what has not been covered uh, is, was the mass killing of Shiite villagers, men, women, and children, basically a for, uh, the begin, at least the beginnings of a genocide. And there are mass graves, some of which are discovered, uh, some of which are excavated. But there's been surprisingly little interest on the part of human rights groups or on the part of the media in, in telling this story. Uh, <clears throat> The, the Taliban, so there's, it, it, and, and the people in the north, both the Tajiks and the Hazaras, are also well armed, well organized. Uh, I, I would say better armed, better organized, certainly than the Taliban. So uh, there isn't a prospect that the Taliban could take those areas. And in fact, there really isn't a prospect that the Taliban could take Kabul. Uh, and so uh, even if we were to withdraw completely, the situation on the ground would be more or less what it is today. Uh, the Taliban controlling the countryside, perhaps they could take all of Kandahar, but not able to go to take Kabul, not able to take the north. <coughs> if we look at the question, we, if, if, you look, if you accept my analysis so far, we do not have to debate the question of whether Afghanistan is important or not. We could all agree that it's very important, although I don't think it's that important. But we could, you, we could assume that it's very important. It still does not make sense to commit this, these kinds of resources to a mission that cannot succeed. Uh, and if the mission cannot succeed, and if there's no way that we can defeat the insurgents, then the question is, is there something else that we can do? And I would argue that there are three achievable missions in Afghanistan. First, we can help protect the North. This actually doesn't require a major effort on our part because, as I said, the people in the North, the Tajiks, the Hazaras, and the Uzbeks are quite well organized, quite capable of defending themselves. So it's some additional support to what they themselves can do. We can help defend Kabul which is uh, a, has become a very large city of some four million, uh, which is uh, a mixed city. The majority is not Pashtun, uh, and which uh, is reasonably secure. Yes, there are terrorist attacks in the city, but it's not like Baghdad, for example, in 2006. And third, we could focus on counterterrorism. Where we had good intelligence, we might strike at uh, Al-Qaeda or at the Taliban leadership, although the, the problem is how do we get good intelligence? Uh, and there, I'll, I'll come to that uh, uh, dilemma as well. Uh, what a nice style tone. <laughs> Ring tone, I mean. Uh, <clears throat> why, why should we change our strategy? Well, the fact is uh, that these resources are not free. If we, have, if we are committing 100,000 troops to Afghanistan, those troops are not available for any other purpose. If we commit $100 billion to Afghanistan, that money is not available to any other purpose. And if the purpose of our being in Afghanistan is because of the war on terror and because of uh, uh, al-Qaeda, then perhaps we should focus the resources on the places where Al-Qaeda is, which is not uh, Afghanistan, or at least Afghanistan is not now high on the list. It's absolutely correct that the September 11th attacks did originate from Taliban-controlled Afghan territory, but that doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda is there now. Where are the Al-Qaeda uh, leaders? Probably in Pakistan, either in the tribal areas or in the Pakistani cities. Uh, certainly, there are many more Al-Qaeda operatives in Yemen or Somalia, uh, and 
possibly in Europe or even in the United States than there are in Afghanistan. So if the war on terror is the priority, then certainly $100 billion to Afghanistan is a misallocation of resources. We can't kid ourselves. There will be negative consequences of withdrawal, particularly for Afghan women and children, uh, women and girls, but in, in the Pashtun areas. On the other hand, uh, is that a reason for us to stay so invested at uh, $100 billion a year? And furthermore, we aren't actually succeeding in a mission that makes the Pashtun areas safe for girls to go to school or for women to have uh, a, a kind of life that uh, actually they would have been able to have had 30 or 40 years ago. Let me um, finally note uh, that as we debate the importance of the war, we should bear in mind the extraordinary imbalance of resources between what we are spending and what the enemy is spending. The, uh, we are spending $100 billion a year. We have 100,000 of the best troops in the world, plus 40,000 troops from our NATO allies, so 140,000 of the best troops in the world. We're fighting an enemy that has about 35,000 part-time fighters, and whose budget, the CIA estimates, is between 60 and $200 million. Uh, if the Al-Qaeda, or the goal of the fundamentalists, the, the terrorists, is to weaken the United States, on the whole, Afghanistan's a pretty good investment for them. For $60 million, they're costing us $100 billion. Uh, and on, from our point of view, I'm not sure that this is a way that we can fight and win the war on terror, especially if, uh, especially if uh, uh, the main uh, targets of the war on terror are, are not there. Finally, and my father always said when you give a speech, you should include the word finally in, in the speech uh, uh, a number of times, because it gives your audience hope. <laughs> Finally, there are, is the political consequences in the United States, and I don't think we can ignore those. Uh, <clears throat> President Obama ha has committed, uh, has tripled the number of troops, tripled the resources uh, in Afghanistan, and so this has become certainly the defining foreign policy problem of his presidency. I think it's fair to say, and I hear I have no inside knowledge, that he himself had reservations about this course of action. Because between when he got Mc General McChrystal's strategy calling for increasing the number of troops, and when he made his decision to implement it, came the Afghan elections and the great clarity with which one could see that we did not have a credible Afghan partner. Nonetheless, he took the advice of the, his military commanders and of the, of the entire democratic foreign policy establishment, uh, which so often wishes to demonstrate that it's more hawkish than the Republicans, uh, and, he, and he made the decision. Basically, the democratic critique, of course, and much of it was right, was that the war Afghanistan was a war of necessity, uh, George Bush, at the time we could have won the war in Afghanistan in 2002, took his eye off the ball, went to Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11, which wasn't a threat to the United States. We lost the chance to, to win in Afghanistan. All of that was right, except for the final statement, which is, and when we come into office, and this was the campaign pitch of Obama, Clinton, and Biden, the three top people now, each one of them said in the 2008 campaign, we will withdraw from Iraq, and we'll put the resources to win the war in Afghanistan. But because we, we didn't win it when it might have been winnable in 2002, 2003, doesn't mean that we can win it in 2010. Uh, and I will conclude with uh, one of my favorite bits of verse, I think will be familiar to m many of you from this part of the word, world, from the Rubiet of Omar Khayyam. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, and not all your piety and wit can lure it back to cancel half a line 
nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Ambassador, am I correct in uh, stating that what you described as the alternative strategy is essentially that which Vice President Biden, we read uh, and hear, is supposed to have promoted within the administration? Yes, essentially. Namely, uh, greatly reduce the number of troops. I would take it from 100,000 to 15,000 and focus on missions that we can achieve which do not include defeating the Taliban, but protecting the non-Taliban areas, the capital, and striking at, at uh, terrorists where we know they are. The one thing about the counterterrorism strategy, and, and this emerges very clearly in the WikiLeaks documents, uh, we are extremely good at being able to get our weapons to the coordinates where we want to get them. We are not so good at knowing who is actually at those coordinates. And that's why we get uh, uh, unintended casualties, civilian casualties. The, in order to use these high-tech weapons, we need good intelligence. Good intelligence requires an Afghan partner, a credible Afghan partner, so that the local population will say, again, Mohammed, who is located in, in this house, is building bombs. Uh, and, and the authorities would have some clear idea that that would, was true. But where you don't have credible authorities, where the population doesn't trust them, your intelligence then is a series of informants uh, who ha may have all sorts of different agendas, including the fact that, hey, they've had a tribal feud with Mohammed, and so rather than ha sending you know, one of their, couple of their Klansmen with Kalishnikovs to take on Mohammed and his buddies. <laughs> they get the Americans to send a high-tech weapon and poof. Uh, there's also a, when you use informants, the in informants, of course, get paid for the information they provide. So they have an incentive to identify all sorts of people as insurgents, whether they are or not, and the people who handle them, their prestige in the organi intelligence organizations you know, CIA and other organizations, depends on the number of informants they have and the quality of the intelligence. So they have a tendency to defend the, the quality of the intelligence, and then the people who make the targeting decisions deny, you know, you have a tendency to deny that there, there was any problem. Um, and, and, and in the absence of an Afghan partner, uh, we, would, we still will have to be very careful about counterterrorism uh, because we do not have the, the kind of intelligence resources that really allow us to identify uh, who's where. Uh, and if we are getting the wrong people, we're just making, well, we're killing people. It's wrong to kill people who, should, who are not enemies. Uh, you're also making enemies. Ambassador, uh, two parts of the question. Ultimately, you articulated why we can't win there. What is the reason that we are there? And what don't we know that is the underlying agenda of the US government or the military that lets us be there in a country that is 11,000 miles away? It's an interesting... Um debate, or interesting point. Uh, if General Petraeus was here, if, um, if uh, any of the people in the Obama administration were here, and they're smart people, and I know them, they're, uh, many of them are friends of mine, we've worked in other situations, they would say to you, the only viable strategy we can have is counterinsurgency. And they would say to you, in order for counterinsurgency to work, we need to have a credible Afghan partner. And if we were having this discussion privately among friends, uh, so with all respect, 
not with a group this large, certainly not with somebody from Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> they would also say that Karzai is not a credible partner and cannot become one. So uh, the reality is that the people who are the architects of the strategy actually know that it's not going to work. And when I've debated people who are proponents, uh, they, they don't ever address that point. They don't come back and say, oh, Karzai's reformable, because they know that that's not true. They shift the debate and they say, we can't afford to lose. Or what would be the consequences if the Taliban came back? Well, that's not a reason to continue a strategy that is not working. And I'll take it a step further. I, frankly, I think there's something immoral about sending young men and women on a mission where they cannot succeed. I mean, yes, you join the military. <laughs> you join the military, you are, you, know, you are going to be sent abroad, you're going to be sent to fight. And, and that, and, you know, I don't have a lot, a lot of sympathy with you know, the number of the service people who say, oh, well, you know, we didn't expect we'd be called up. But yes, you're a reservist, you may be called up. I understand the disruption. But I think the political leaders and the top military leaders have an obligation to commit people to only in circumstances where there is, a, where there is objectively a, a good chance of success and where they themselves believe it. Frankly, it is in this regard that Afghanistan perhaps most resembles Vietnam. And one of the most disillusioning things for me was, well, to read McNamara's book and to listen to Lyndon Johnson's tapes when it became so obvious that they were continuing to commit, you know, send young men to, to their deaths for a mission they knew wasn't working. That, that, that to me is really wrong. Whoever has the microphone. <laughs> Two questions. If we prevail in Afghanistan, what do we get? And if we withdraw from Afghanistan, what do we lose? Well, we, if you accept my analysis, we cannot prevail if prevailing means defeating the Taliban insurgency. We don't have a strategy that will do that, so I can't answer that question. Um, what do we lose? Not very much. Because, in fact, the Taliban cannot go much beyond the green areas on this map. They cannot take Kabul, they cannot go to the north. Uh, and, and I think we also need to look at what were the arguments uh, for, Af for being in Afghanistan. Well, first, to deny al-Qaeda a base. We've done that. And I think there's a reasonable chance, even if the Taliban, well, the Taliban are operating and do have bases in, in, in the green areas of this map, and al-Qaeda's not back there. Uh, the second reason is Afghanistan's not that important, but Pakistan is enormously important. Uh, it, it's a country of 180 million people, and it has nuclear weapons. And, of course, there's an insurgency operating in Pakistan. But the, the fact is that Pakistan is enormously important to Afghanistan. Pakistan, Pakistan's ISI, it's an inter-services intelligence agency that's military intelligence, but really, you know, a, a equivalent of the CIA on steroids, ocu uh, operating uh, both uh, internationally and uh, domestically in Pakistan. Yes, they helped create the Taliban with the ISI support was indispensable to the Taliban ta uh, success in the 90s. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and, it, and, and the ISI continues to support the Taliban. The Taliban leaders are all in Pakistan. Uh, 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 nobody, nobody seriously can believe that the Pakistani army and the ISI don't know where Mullah Omar and, and all these guys are. In fact, there are reasons to believe that they have at various times since 2001 been uh, in military canton cantonment areas. Uh, so uh, Pakistan is a key player in Afghanistan. The other way around, it isn't, it isn't so. Pakistan is, is a very troubled country, uh, uh, but it is not 
uh, uh, on the borderline of being a failed state, and the Punjabi-dominated military certainly are not going to let Pashtun uh, uh, tribal uh, uh, insurgents, or Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, grab those nuclear weapons. So the, that, that's a long way of saying, uh, I don't think we have that much to lose in Afghanistan. We can't win, uh, uh, and the downside is not very great. Ambassador, I noticed you haven't mentioned any anti-narcotics policies in terms of the anti-terrorism policies you've been talking about in terms of Afghanistan. The growing opium poppy production is fueling most of the tribal warlordism in the provinces and the corruption in the government. Is that part of the strategy in Afghanistan? Well, first is a question of what is actually funding what in Afghanistan. Uh, I think there's pretty good reason to think that the people who are funding the Taliban is in the United States. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that distinguishes the American army today from the American army in, of the Vietnam era is that at least half the military tasks that were carried out in Vietnam by uniformed soldiers are today carried out by contractors. And so if you want a comparison, you know, the, the, we, we have the equivalent of 200, and we have 100,000 uniformed troops in, in Afghanistan and perhaps 100,000 contractors. So it's not that we have one-fifth the number of forces in Afghanistan as Vietnam. We have you know, maybe 40%. Now, when these, with the contractors, uh, how, do they, how do they bring in, they, they're doing all the support stuff, including bringing in supplies. The major su supply route comes to the Pakistani port of Karachi and goes up through Quetta to Chaman, or, or some of it uh, up to Peshawar and through the Khyber Pass. In either case, these uh, uh, contract convoys that are bringing in U.S. supplies to Bagram Air Base north of Kabul are passing through Taliban areas. Contractors don't want their trucks to get shot up, they don't want their drivers to get killed, and they don't want their supplies to be diverted, because of course if they don't deliver the supplies, they don't get paid. So, what do they do? They pay transit fees to the Taliban. So the, <laughs> the a part of the money that, that we are spending to supply the, you know, the $100 billion operation that we have that is headquartered at Bagram Air Base is being skimmed off to pay the Taliban the really paltry 60 to $200 million that they use to fuel the insurgency. Now to come back to the drug trade. Yes, the Taliban are, are also part of the drug trade. Uh, so is uh, the gov government officials and so are these uh, power brokers. Uh, it's been virtually impossible to come up with an effective strategy to deal with the drug trade uh, because, I mean, the, the inherent problem is the, it goes with the economics of it, which is that the price that people pay on the street for heroin is 10 or maybe even 100,000 times the price that's paid the farmer. And so, if you start to eradicate crops, or you try to have a substitution program, have persuade them to grow wheat rather than poppy, uh, all the traffickers need to do is to increase the price that's paid to the producer. And they can increase it 100 times, and it has no I impact on their bottom line. Uh, and that's why the various anti-drug uh, strategies that have been adopted haven't worked. Under the Bush administration, we tried eradication. The Obama administration stopped eradication and is focusing on the traffickers and the networks. But uh, uh, neither strategy is likely to work. Uh, and that's frankly why uh, it's not a, although we, we put a huge effort into it, it's not really a big part of my analysis of the situation. Uh, what, microphone? Um, one more question. One more question. 
Thank you. Um, in the last several months, we've been reading a lot about um, um, uh, minerals, et cetera, valuable uh, uh, forms of, of uh, materials that can come out of Afghanistan. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Is this really uh, something that's been newly discovered? Um, is it, what parts of the country is it, is it realistic that it can be exploited effectively and possibly as a result um, take the focus away from the poppy crop? Well, first it's not gonna take the focus away from the poppy crop uh, because you know, even as people benefit from natural resources, they still wanna make money in other ways. Uh, and as long as poppy is profitable, uh, poppy will, will likely be grown. But, uh, and in terms, yes, uh, this is the wonders of the American media. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, as you might have it, uh, have, if you read the stories, uh, particularly as the New York Times reported it, you know, there's a sort of breathlessly that, uh, there's, that the, there was this secret Pentagon study that they had gotten hold of that revealed a trillion dollars in, in um, uh, resources in Afghanistan under the ground. Well, actually, this wasn't American. This was surveys that Soviet geologists did in the 1980s. And this data was, is not secret, and it was known. Uh, we certainly knew it uh, uh, in, in, uh, in when I was with the UN mission last year. Uh, Ashraf Ghani, who had been the finance minister, has been talking about this for years. Uh, Afghanistan has uh, some of the uh, largest de uh, uh, de copper deposits in the world, uh, has uh, enormous iron ore deposits. Uh, those deposits are roughly in the green area, the central area, highlands, which is controlled by the Hazaras, one of the safest areas in the country. I think I have a map that, uh, if you, the, if the area that has no security, and uh, uh, almost no security incidents right in the center uh, is where those are. Uh, in the south in Helmand province where there's a lot of security incidents, there's some of the richest supplies of lithium. This is a rare earth mineral that is essential for the, make this computer run and electric cars. So people talk of it as the new petroleum, new oil. Uh, then there are uh, gems, gold, uh, and, 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 a, and, and actually some oil in the north. The difficulty is, in order to have a large copper mine or iron ore, which is, a, these are essentially high volume, low, low value uh, products, you need to have ways of transporting it. Rail, there are, there are no railroads in Afghanistan. Building them is technically a difficult task. Uh, it is difficult to do in circumstances of uh, areas where insurgents are operating. Uh, and companies are not prepared to make those many billion dollar investments under those circumstances. That's why the Soviets didn't do it in the 80s. That's why it's not happening now. The same thing's true, actually, lithium requires a fairly extensive capital investment. So while all that stuff is there, the only things that are really being exploited now uh, there's some wildcat mining of, of rare earth minerals, including lithium and gems, because gems you can, th those are high value, low volume products. Uh, so yes, the potential's there, but when, will the potential be realized in the next 50 years? Under present circumstances, there's no reason to think it will. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.